Remember back to Unit 1, the Battle of Crecy, the Plague, the Fall of Constantinople? We called that unit Things Fall Apart. The phrase actually comes from one of the most famous poems of the 20th century, and perhaps my favorite poem, period. This is the first verse, which talks about how the world is falling apart at the end of World War I. So what do you think this means? The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Well, in medieval times, people hunted with falcons who were directed by a hunter or falconer. But the hunting beasts now seem to be out of control, and maybe society is out of control too. The statesmen who started World War I have lost control of the forces they unleashed. A tide of blood is drowning the world and the innocence of an earlier world with it. And in this new world, the people with the strongest beliefs and the greatest willingness to act on those beliefs are the people whose moral values are especially hateful. And that's exactly where we're heading now. Maybe the most famous of the post-World War I books was All Quiet on the Western Front, which was written by a German novelist and made into a popular and important American movie. So here's a short clip from that movie that I think really captures the post-World War I disillusionment. And so we begin our look at the forces that led to a second world war. A war, you've seen this uh, chart before, that would have even broader scope than the first world war and would kill many more innocent civilians. You know I like to use art to get inside the spirit of historical periods. I want to show you three paintings. The first one is by a French painter. What do you notice about these colors? Well, they're weird, right? Trees aren't generally blue, orange, and red. This painting, this is a German painting, has weird colors too, but what difference do you notice between the two? I'm going to flash them uh, so you can see it again. Okay, the colors are a little weird, but the overall effect is pretty cheerful, isn't it? The painter is French. France had suffered a lot of destruction in World War I, and French leaders and the French people continued to be very worried about a threat from Germany. But France between the wars was also a vibrant center of art and literature and music. What about these colors? They create a much grimmer mood, don't they? And as we saw in the last lecture, life in Germany was pretty grim from the end of World War I to the Depression in the early 1930s. I'm going to return to Germany in just a few minutes. Before we get to Adolf Hitler, the rise of the Nazi party, and the Holocaust against the Jews and other so-called undesirable people, let's travel south and see what happened in another country where democracy fell apart, Italy. The painting you see here was actually painted during, not after World War I, but it represented a movement in Italy called Futurism that had important ties to fascism. The Futurists basically worshipped progress, they worshipped military strength, and they were huge admirers of war. Notice these, uh, this train, you know, a symbol of military power with the soldiers fighting in unison. Essentially, they were social Darwinists. Their message, basically, was that the future belonged to the efficient warrior and the warrior machine. Now, this is a message that would have turned a lot of people off in France and England by 1919. They had seen more than enough killing machines in the trenches. Thank you very much. But Italy had entered World War I late. Basically, the Italian government bargained with both sides, seeing which one would offer it the biggest territorial bribe for entering the war on their side. France and England won the bribery race, but a lot of Italians were dissatisfied with what they got at the Treaty of Versailles. Basically, they didn't think Italy got enough territorial loot. And it is true that they did not get all the territory that they'd been promised when they entered the war. Partly, by the way, because Italian troops hadn't actually proved all that effective in the war. So Italy was both less disillusioned with more and more war and more disillusioned with peace than most of Western Europe. The Italian economy also suffered very hard times in the years after the war. So enter our first dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini rose to power in Italy in the 1920s, and in fact he was one of Hitler's role models, then allies in World War II. It was Mussolini's party that created the term fascism, named after fascis or bundles of rods tied together. These were uh, bundles of rods that were carried by Roman political leaders during the Roman Republic, actually by Roman lictors to be specific. 
So what might have been the message of bundled rods? Well, they're actually a very old symbol. They symbolize the power of the people united together under leadership. And the acts actually represented Roman officials' power over life and death through imposition of the death penalty. But the bundled sticks with the acts really came to stand for collective strength, again, strength through national unity, uh, with the acts as military strength. So let's watch a video clip about Mussolini's career. You should be taking notes. Fascism grew out of socialism in Germany. It was actually called National Socialism, but it also broke with socialism in important ways. So consider this still another ism and one you really ought to know. Marx had thought that nationalism was a dangerous illusion that encouraged workers to submit to bosses. Fascists, on the other hand, believed in the power of nations. Many fascists uh, embraced theories of racial superiority that grew out of social Darwinism. Fascists also rejected the notion of a class struggle. Instead, they thought that workers and capitalists should unite together with the government to create economic growth. So like socialists, fascists believed that the government should take a strong role in directing the economy, but they tended to form alliances with big business uh, and to discourage any but labor organizations, any labor organizations that weren't firmly controlled by the state. At a time when many Americans and Europeans were looking for ways to promote disarmament, that means the destruction of weapons, fascists believed in rearming the state. They viewed military investment as important both for national power and unity and for economic recovery. Uh, it's interesting to note the Italian fascists actually made their peace with the Catholic Church, which had been quite unhappy with Italy's democratic government because it didn't feel it was protective enough of the Vatican. Uh, and actually, the idea of cooperation among social groups as opposed to class struggle had some roots in Catholic social theory, although the church did not embrace social Darwinism. Uh, I should note that German fascists were much more openly anti-Christian and that many of the opponents to Nazism uh, were, in fact, devout Christians. Today, we look at fascism through the prism of World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust. But in the 1930s, when the rest of the world was being pounded by the Great Depression, Italy's economic growth and the state control of the economy looked pretty impressive. There was a famous phrase, Mussolini made the trains run on time. I had to work hard to find this recording. You're the Top was a famous song by the most important American songwriter of the 1930s, Cole Porter. This is a version of the song that was featured in the musical Anything Goes. The reason it was hard to find this version was that the musical's directors changed the words after Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, something we'll talk about more in my next lecture. But before I move on to the rise of Hitler, let me talk briefly about another creepy leader who came to power in the 1920s and 30s. Again, Keep in mind that this was a time when people all around the world were questioning the value of democracy. After all, the democracies of France, Britain, and the United States had, ju had proved just as willing to go to war as the autocracies of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. And democracy wasn't saving countries from the horrors of the Great Depression either. Lots of people thought that Soviet Russia might offer a better model, but most of the people who thought this lived outside of Russia. Inside of Russia, a new dictator had succeeded Lenin, Joseph Stalin. He would end up killing even more people than Hitler, both in his own death camps and even more in the famine created by his forced agricultural collectivist policies, which many people think were a deliberate attempt to, to destroy the peasants. Remember the Great Leap Forward and Mao? Anyway, we'll talk more about Stalin when we talk about communism in the Cold War, but I thought I should include him here since I'm talking about the rise of dictators in the 20s and 30s. But now, finally, let's move on to the big one, Adolf Hitler. We're going to watch a lot of documentary clips in the next few days, but actually I think that one of the best movies ever made about Germany between the war and the rise of Hitler is a musical called Cabaret. It's something you might actually enjoy watching over the break, although I should warn it does have a little sex and violence pretty mild by today's standards. Much of the action in the movie actually takes place in a Berlin cabaret or nightclub. 
Berlin was a major center of modern art, music, literature, theater, something that attracted a lot of people and also horrified a lot of people, including Hitler. Once Hitler came to power, he actually held a famous art exhibition, which he called the exhibit of degenerate art. Later on, artists would, rightly in my view, consider it an honor for Hitler to have labeled them as degenerates. At any rate, let's watch two clips from Cabaret, which I think kind of capture this contrast and maybe give you a little bit of a sense of the attraction of Nazism for many Germans. So the first one shows one of the Cabaret's musical numbers, but it also captures the hard life of German, Germany in the early 1930s and the obsession with money. Note that this movie takes place just before Hitler comes to power, but a time when the Nazi party was gaining more and more support. And now let's watch a second scene from the movie. This one takes place in a beer garden out in the countryside. So what would the people sitting in that beer garden have thought about the nightclub performance? They probably would have found it pretty degenerate, right? And here, I think, is a harder question. Think about this honestly. If you had been sitting in that beer garden with your family, would you maybe have been tempted to stand up and sing along with the cool kids who were leading the song? Let me explain what I'm going to try to do with the rest of this lecture. I'm actually going to try to make you more sympathetic with the Germans' willingness to support or at least put up with Adolf Hitler. Please do not misunderstand me. In a list of villainous world leaders, and unfortunately it is a long list, Hitler still probably gets the number one position. We're going to spend much of this unit looking at the horrors Hitler inflicted on Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and anyone else who didn't fit his horrible, creepy vision of a master race. But still, there is a danger that all of this is going to end up sounding like something that happened long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Well, think about ISIS militants beheading uh, Coptic Christians in Libya. Or think about the bombing of the World Trade Center. Or the genocide in Rwanda and Bosnia. Treats still in store for you. Things can still fall apart in our world. And since we're your defense against the dark arts teachers, we want you to understand this. So let's start our exploration of Hitler with a video clip that offers some basic early biographical information. You should now know and be putting in your notes template that Hitler was born in Austria, which was now just a small rump of a country cut off from the rest of what had been an empire uh, that had been ruled from Vienna, Austria's capital. Hitler served as a corporal in World War I, and he viewed the war years as the best years of his life. The short little biographical video didn't talk about this, but since I teach art history too, I had to throw it in. Hitler actually wanted to be an artist. He wasn't absolutely terrible, although he wasn't all that good either, and he was very conventional at a time when art was becoming much more experimental and daring, as you saw. So here's one of Hitler's watercolors. At any rate, Hitler failed to achieve his first great goal, which was to get into the Vienna Arts Academy. I have to say, if you could jump into a time machine uh, and change history for the better, you might be tempted to suggest to the admissions committee of the Vienna Arts Academy that maybe they should let him in, even if he's not that talented, so that he would not turn to other occupations. Anyway. Hitler was made Chancellor of Germany by conservative German politicians who thought that he would be a valuable puppet. They basically thought they could control him and keep control of Germany, keep the socialists from coming into power. Bad call. The leader of these politicians, by the way, was Germany's president and former military leader, Paul von Hindenburg. But on his very first day as chancellor, Hitler actually manipulated Hindenburg into dissolving the legislature, the Reichstag, and calling for new elections, which, by the way, uh, would be held with Hitler's SS troops pretty much controlling the streets and a great deal of intimidation of voters. By the way, that very same evening, Hitler attended a dinner with the German army general staff and told them that Germany would rearm as a first step toward regaining its former position in the world. He also told them that his plan was to conquer lands to the east and to push the conquered peoples out to give Germans Lebensraum, or living space. Well, Hitler then concocted a plan to cause a panic by burning the building where the German parliament met. You see a picture of that here. 
and blaming it on the communists. Somewhat ironically, as it turned out, a communist arsonist probably really did set fire to the Reichstag. He was helped, uh, encouraged by high-ranking Nazis, but exactly what happened that night remains something of a mystery to historians. At any rate, at the time, most people seemed to have bought Hitler's communist plot story. Uh, take a look in your notes template and you will see a British journalist's eyewitness account. What we do know is that there's no doubt that Hitler used the fire as an excuse to seize emergency powers. So let's turn to the first of a series of clips we're going to see from a video called The Master Race. We'll put the entire thing on Moodle. It's actually well worth watching. But let's see how he consolidated his power and the steps he took to revive the German economy. Again, those are questions in your notes template. Something I really like about this documentary uh, is that it helps explain how Hitler got away with his brutal policies, and maybe even a little why the world tolerated his rise to power. Remember that this, again, this was not a time when democracies were feeling self-confident. They were not doing very well at pulling their own countries out of depression. Many people in Britain and the United States in particular had come to believe that the Versailles Treaty was too harsh toward Germany and remember that communists really were posing a threat in much of Eastern Europe. The news coming out of Stalin's Russia was pretty grim. To many, at this point, Hitler looked like the lesser evil. Hitler was also a master of propaganda. This is a very famous quote from his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, uh, who was also one of the architects of Hitler's final solution for murdering people who didn't fit his vision of the master race. So let's watch another section of this video. By the way, the, the longer quote is in your notes template, something you should make sure you understand. Hitler did not only master radio and make sure everyone had access to radio propaganda, he also staged huge propaganda events, especially nighttime uh, events lit by lanterns and by electric floodlights. I'm going to backtrack to the big beginning of this video to show you one of his most famous nighttime parades. This is actual documentary footage, and there's something remarkable about it. Can you guess what, it, what that is? So, what was remarkable? This was filmed in color. Germany was at the cutting edge of film technology. Uh, Hitler used absolutely every technique he could to maintain his power. And one of the most constant propaganda messages was that most of Germany's problems were being caused by the Jews. Let's listen to a clip from a Nazi propaganda speech. And now, I think in some ways this is even creepier, take a look at these Nazi propaganda films designed to encourage pure Germans to produce a master race. By the way, Jews were not the only people whom the Nazis declared impure and unworthy of being Germans. This photo shows an SS officer and a Nazi psychologist interviewing a gypsy woman. Let's watch another clip from our master race and see some of Hitler's other uh, victims. But for everyone else, life in Germany was getting better at the end of the 1930s. And Hitler's foreign policy successes in Europe were stoking German pride. In my next lecture, I'm going to look at the disintegration of the European order established by the Treaty of Versailles and the steps, the timeline, basically, that led Europe into a Second World War. But if you have time, I'd like to close with one more clip from the video showing Germany on the eve of the war.